Dr. Rick Nam next right here on Weather Underground. A lot to get to in that report. Welcome in, everyone. This is Weather Underground. I'm Mike Bettis. I'm Alex Wilson, of course, with our hurricane expert, Dr. Rick Nabb. Some really interesting findings there. Some states that are doing a lot of the right things and some states that have a lot of work to do. And when you consider a state like Florida that has been near the top of the strong building codes list for a while, I think Hurricane Ian would have been a lot more expensive had mm -hmm. they not had those strong building codes in place. So other states can learn, and some states are learning. There are some mm -hmm. states that are improving, but we're going to point out some places where we have some specific things that states yeah. could do to get us more ready. Yeah. You're going to break it down state by state yep. in some of these places. We're also going to talk with some of the people behind the findings yep. in that survey, mm -hmm. so in that, that report, so stick around for that coming up here. In the meantime, a lot of weather to get to stateside. Some storms in a few locations, rainy weather for others. Yeah, we take a look at Chicago. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah, what are you no, getting? Are you getting the bramble, brambleberry? Graters with the chocolate chunks in it. Oh, that sounds better. Yeah. I like that idea. Uh, a reminder as we get into the warmer months, never okay to leave a child or a pet in a car unattended. A Slidell couple was arrested after leaving their five-month-old in their car while they ran into a store to do some quick shopping. Now, the car was running, the baby uninjured, but in Louisiana, it is against the law to leave any child younger than 10 alone in a vehicle for any amount of time. And of course, if the car is not running, we got to start thinking about that. How do kids get into cars and if kids are left inside vehicles? A temperature tomorrow in Houston of 86 degrees after just 10 minutes inside that vehicle. It's 105, 120 after 30 minutes. So again, really have to think about the repercussions of even leaving a pet in the car just to run in a store and grab a prescription. It's going to get really hot in just a few minutes. And again, looking before we lock, we're also at that time of year where our our schedules start to change, right? Uh, school is going to be wrapping up here soon. Maybe you're doing daycare drop ups that drop offs that you hadn't done before. Check the back seat before you leave that vehicle. You know, a lot of cars nowadays do beep too. If you've opened that back seat and closed it before you started the car, they'll remind you to uh, check it before you leave it. Orlando tomorrow, 84 after just 10 minutes, 103 inside a vehicle, 118 degrees after 30 minutes. So again, dangerous, deadly heat in a short period of time now that we get these spring and of course summer temperatures that are on the way. Unfortunately, we see these hot car deaths continue and, and the months obviously spiking into the ones that we're approaching. So the Junes, the July, the August, that's when we see most of our car deaths, but at least one each month on average of the year. So it can happen in these comfortable spring, even late winter temperatures. Uh, January and February each average one hot car death. You can have a high in the upper 60s, and inside that vehicle it gets into the 90s. Uh, child caught hard, hot car deaths by temperature range. Again, a lot of these are these very hot days, the 80 to 90, 90 to 100 degree days. But 3% sub-70 degree temperatures, 70 to 79 degrees, 8% of our uh, hot car deaths. So it doesn't have to be the hottest day again of the year to see these problems happen. Thursday, 64 million people above 80, most of that across the Southern Plains and the Gulf Coast and Florida. By Saturday, we see that creep northward. So now we've got 114 million people with temps above 80. Uh, again, forgotten by caregiver continues to be the most common reason for a child hot car death, but a child playing in an unattended car, Mike, sometimes we don't think about that. You know, a car's left unlocked in the driveway, a child gets in, unable to get out, and the parents don't know where they are. Think about that if we're at the beaches. The weather looks absolutely beautiful, but in the water, that's where the danger will be. Miami Beach through the rest of the week, expect temperatures in the low 80s, maybe a few extra clouds into Saturday, but still plenty of sunshine. Now tomorrow, we start things off in South Florida with a burn time of 10 minutes in Miami. Got to have that sunscreen on, making our way up to the north, more in the way of sunscreen necessity. Uh, Vero Beach, Florida, 79 degrees, mostly sunny skies, burn time also 10 minutes. Let's continue up 95. Daytona Beach, Florida, very similar forecast, closing in on 80, a burn time of 10 minutes with nothing but sun. So expect a lot of that blue sky overhead as you sit out on the beach or maybe we're going to walk around always perusing the t-shirt shops. They've got some funny ones. Uh, Pensacola, sunshine Wednesday, sunshine Thursday, a few extra clouds Friday and Saturday. We keep those temps right around 80 degrees each and every day. So again, this is going to be another one of those spots where the sunscreen is an absolute necessity. Pensacola, 10 minute burn time. Uh, water temperatures, they're going to start to warm up. So again, you're going to start to want to get in the water, but you got to watch those flags. I'd swim at the guarded beaches. Panama City still a little cool in the water, 68 your water temperature. But I know some of you are like, whatever, I can handle it. Obviously, you get into West Florida out over the Gulf temperatures in the uh, upper 70s in this part of the Gulf. So very, very mild and clear water, Mike. All right, Alex, thank you for that. All and right, now, the boys train the building code, uh, you know, 
surveyors to do better. So they've really stepped it up in the aftermath of all these storms. Yeah, and you mentioned the, the barrage of hurricanes the mm -hmm. state has experienced in recent years, but also, you know, they updated their building codes to get consistent with the international building code. And that's important because, you know, building materials that are used, building practices changed, you have to keep up with the times. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, you know, train folks who are doing the work to strengthen homes so that it's done correctly. And all of this lessens the vulnerability of buildings to wind. Now, th this report is all about wind. You know, we've got the vulnerability to surge and, and, and rain-induced flooding and all that, but uh, when it comes to wind, you know, a state like Louisiana is trending safer because they are raising the expectations of how strong their buildings need to be by law. It seems like they've done better in recent years, and they've had several hits, but you would have thought that after Katrina in particular, that this would have been priority number one, and it hasn't necessarily been. No, it hasn't, but you know, when you compare Louisiana to some other states, you get even more head-scratching situations where a state like North Carolina uh, that recently has passed legislation that they're not going to update their building codes for at least the next six or seven years. So you know, there are states that are obviously very vulnerable and have taken some recent hits that are taking some steps backwards. So there are competing forces. There's a lot of arguments between uh, you know, disaster safety advocates and builders about what th this will actually cost. What does this mean financially for the state? So it often comes down to, at the state level, legislative debates about money. Yeah, it's interesting to look at Louisiana sandwiched between a bunch of states with much poorer scores. So it's not necessarily about your geographic location. It's all about no. what you're doing within the state. Isn't that interesting? And during the show today, we're going to compare states that are like right next to one another right. and have very similar vulnerabilities, but are uh, you know, attacking this issue very, very differently. Texas and Louisiana, very different. Texas has much weaker building codes statewide. Um, we're going to compare Florida and Alabama uh, mm -hmm. with statewide building codes in Alabama, a lot weaker than uh, in Florida. But on the East Coast, if you compare states like Virginia and New York, they're very different. Virginia right. is now at the right. top of the list. You know, and New York has strong building codes. New York's problem is they're not licensing their contractors. So there's so many pieces to this puzzle. What's interesting about Virginia, because they rank at the very top of this of this list, right? Their vulnerability doesn't seem to be um, quite that other states. I mean, you would you would assume then yeah. that like a Florida or a Texas or Gulf Coast state is much more vulnerable than a, than a Virginia. Yeah, you would think that you know, the Gulf Coast states uh, in the, the southeastern states would be the first in line to have the strongest building codes. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at states like Virginia and states farther north that are doing reasonably well on this report, they realize that only takes one, right? And then everybody's financial situation is much worse after a big hurricane hit when you haven't prepared ahead of time. But this, again, it's about three different components. It's the strength of the building codes, the training, and uh, you know, the, the knowledgeable level of the building code officials, right. and it's about are you licensing the contractors and training the contractors who do the work. Some states are doing well in others, mm -hmm. other areas, some states not so much, but it's for, for different reasons. But I think it all starts with having strong building codes, the laws, the minimum legal requirement for how strong your buildings need to be. That's the first step to you know, being more resilient. Right, it feels like those other two things, those support that. Obviously, if you've got the, you've got the strong building codes, but you don't necessarily have the, the people who uphold yeah. them understanding it, then you've got the problem. Right, and that's why Texas and Alabama are so far down the list, because they don't have strong statewide building codes, and they have next to nothing in terms of code enforcement from the state level. And as we talked to Ann Cope a little bit ago, leaving it to local communities to do this, but a lot of times either they, they choose not to do it at the local level or they don't realize that there isn't a strong state building code. They don't realize the vulnerability they're leaving themselves in. That to me seems like a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And we think about what, what would the insurance claims be after yeah. a major event? It could be catastrophic for some states. Yep, and again, Florida shows us that building codes work. Ian would have been a $3 billion more expensive if not for the strong building codes in that state. We're going to talk more about our coverage continuing.